Good evening, family. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. This is your pastor, and I am so excited to be able to share with you once again the word of God. And uh, we will jump right in. I'm not going to prolong the time. I thank you for giving me just a, a few minutes of your attention, and I try not to keep you long. But at the same time, as my brother always says, it doesn't have to be long to be strong. It can yet make an impact. I, we started looking at um, a few lessons ago. We started looking at mind management, how to manage your mind. And I guess you can put this lesson in that same category because we're talking today about, um, you know, how to intentionally meditate or shift your thoughts. There it is. That's better. Shifting your thinking uh, to manage your emotions. You know, it's it's um, the way we feel our emotional um, <clears throat> life is largely reactionary. Our emotions are, in other words, a response to something else that we've allowed to go on in our own heads. So if I can control my emotions and my, or my thinking and the way I direct my thoughts, the way I manage my thoughts, I can control my emotions. You know, I can control my emotions out. I, I think quite often, um, because I, you know, at times struggle with claustrophobia and to be a man that uh, spends as much time on airplanes when things are normal as I do, that that can be a debilitating uh, deficiency to struggle with claustrophobia and to be on an airplane sometimes for 18 hours, you know. But I, I've learned how and one of the things that helped me, I, I've learned how to manage my mind in those situations so as to. Uh, forecast my emotions as opposed to allowing my mind to get caught up in the things that would generate uh, emotion that would make that plane flight uh, horrific. I, I cast my thoughts intentionally into an area that pulls me away from that and generates the kind of relaxation that I need. And one of the things that helped me to face that was I was on <clears throat> an airplane a few times early on when I first started flying quite a lot. And, um, and I'm sitting there and I'm struggling with this idea of claustrophobia, which is pretty much an idea. It's something that somehow got stuck in the brain. And so now when the brain recalls this thing that has gotten stuck, then the, the, the physiology and the psychology begin to work together to create this panic of sorts. But I, I thought about it one day. I was on an airplane. So now you're on an airplane. Yeah, you can get up and walk down. You can go to the restroom. People serving you stuff and all of this kind of thing. And he says now, the Holy Spirit says to me, he says now, what are those guys and ladies doing? <clears throat> Excuse me who are in the prison cell right now. How does, a, how does a human being survive the prison cell? And you, you're here, you can't survive an airplane. And then I realized it has to be psychological because I'm certain that there are many people who are in prison who have the same makeup of claustrophobia or thoughts of claustrophobia and have to manage those situations. So it, it was then that I began to intentionally use my brain to work against those things that um, the way my brain had been programmed to work was creating negative reaction. I hope that makes sense. That's, it sounds like, a <laughs> sounds like I've been rambling, <clears throat> but I, I was saying something if you paid attention. But going back to Philippians chapter four and verse eight and reading from the Amplified, it says, for the rest, brethren, what, what, whatever is true, whatever is worthy of reverence and is honorable 
and seemly, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and lovable, whatever is kind and winsome and gracious, if there's any virtue and excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on and weigh and take account of these things. Fix your minds on them. Fix your minds on them. Now, that's a powerful text. It's, and it's talking about what? Managing your mind through managing your thoughts, the content of your thoughts, even pre-thinking the content of your thoughts, managing your mind, and then you can manage your life. Because again, emotions are quite often the consequence of baseless, um, unbridled imaginations. You know, like I, I said, with the whole idea of claustrophobia. Well, that more than likely came from some event probably in my childhood that I don't remember where I was in, in some closed space and it left an imprint on my psyche. And so now my imagination, uh, that imprint feeds my imagination and then that imagination creates um, baseless, unbridled emotion. Now, there are three things that you may do to harness negative feelings or negative thoughts. Three things you can do. I kind of harped on, you know, the whole idea of my being <clears throat> uh, claustrophobic or having feelings of claustrophobia. But this works in all aspects. You know, maybe you're having negative thoughts, negative feelings about uh, job loss, maybe having negative feelings about uh, being restricted because of Corona, maybe having negative feelings about just the uncertainty of things. Maybe you're having negative feelings about having lost your or feeling like you've lost your community and that you can't go to your clubs. You can't go to your church. You can't even be around certain family members like you would like to. And these thoughts are dominating your 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 mind and creating emotion in you that becomes personally toxic and self-sabotaging. These three things that I'm going to give you in the next 15 minutes at the most, I want you to really ponder. And if you have something to write with, get it now and, and write this down because this is going to help you. Number one, intentionally concentrate on your advantages. When I was in that airplane and, and I was having that what felt like, um, you know, panic attack due to claustrophobia. I started thinking on my advantages. I thought about how I'm sitting here in first class in an airplane. And I actually have much more space than a man who's in prison has. And he's managing his situation. How in the world can you not manage yours? And uh, you're sitting here, you're in first class. You have a computer, you have internet, you have a phone, you can play games, you can do work. You can do all sorts of things to um, distract your mind from this uh, focus that is working against you. You have to intentionally concentrate on your advantages. Now, you've lost your job. You know, you've lost your job. What are your advantages? Uh, you have options, you're educated. If, if the geographical area you're in does not provide job opportunities, you can move. Uh, what are your advantages? You've lost your job, but you have family and friends that help you. I know you may not be most comfortable with that, but that's a major advantage. What are your advantages? You lost your job, but you have money in the bank. Uh, you're getting unemployment. You, you know, you, you, you have you have irons in the fire. You have friends that are uh, giving you leads. You have to begin to if you're going to control your mind, if you're going to manage your mind when you're in the grips of something that is negative, you're going to have to intentionally concentrate on your advantages. Now, what does this do for you? <clears throat> this gives you perspective. When I sat on that plane and I thought about the prisoner versus me, what did it do for me? It gave me perspective. Stop tripping. Stop tripping. 
You, you, you know, you have it better than a whole lot of people. And, and then my, what happened? My, my mind calmed, my body started calming down. And then eventually I learned how to get on an airplane without having all of those issues. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I would, you know, I, I would hate to think that I would have had to go through the last seven, eight years of my life with as much travel as I've had to do and not have a handle on this. The Bible says in Ephesians 5 and 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What, is, what does he say? Giving thanks always for all things. Now, how, how is it that you can give thanks for all things? It means that you have to intentionally think about all things. This, this is what intentionally concentrating on advantages will do for you. The only way I can give thanks for all things is that I have to think about all things. I have to think about how I have it, how it could be. I have to think about how I have it versus how others have it. First Thessalonians 5 and 18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So I must intentionally concentrate on my what? Advantages. Intentionally concentrate on, on my advantages. That's, that's one way you can, you can begin to manage your mind when your mind is trying to run away with you concerning negative circumstances. Intentionally concentrate on my advantages. Most of you that are watching me, or should I say a lot of you that are watching me now, have never taken the time to really think about your advantages. You've been so consumed with what you feel like are your disadvantages and what's not working that you've not taken the time to really think about what are my advantages. And if you do, you will find that it will begin to bring calm to your mental storm. Now, number two, <clears throat> when your mind is carried away, forgive me for clearing my throat. I'm, I'm struggling with these sinuses right now. But when your mind is is carried away with negativity that feels like it's pulling you into a depression or into a heaviness. Invest yourself into helping others. Only three things. So stay with me. Invest yourself into think about your advantages. Number one. Number two, when you feel like nothing's going right for you, invest yourself into helping others. Now, what does this principle do for you? This gives you purpose. The first principle gives you perspective, but this principle gives you purpose. And there's nothing like locating purpose in the middle of panic. You know, there's nothing like it. Um, Jesus endured the sufferings of the cross for the joy that was set before him. Well, the joy that was set before him was what he was doing to help humanity. It, it, he was doing none of that for himself. He was doing, he went through everything he went through for you and I and billions and billions of other people. You see, because investing yourself into helping others is a way of stabilizing the psyche when you otherwise would be going, you know, nuts. Listen to what Ephesians 6, 7, and 8 says. With good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. So we, I, you know, we do things for people as unto the Lord, understanding the principle. Whatever I do for you, God makes it happen for me. So if I relieve your stress, God steps into my life to relieve mine. If, if I uh, step into your life and I bring joy into your world, God in turn will bring joy into mine. We have to view one another as an opportunity to tap into a spiritual principle. What whatsoever I sow, that shall I also reap. So when I'm in that place and I can do nothing for myself, I think about how can I help someone else? And when I devote myself 
to the service or the aid of others. It's then that there's a shift in my mind, you know, and, and the thing that would have normally pulled me under and would have sabotaged my joy and my peace. Now, all of a sudden, it's caught up in this tsunami of ministry and care and concern for others. And while I'm caring for you, God is caring for me. So by the time I'm through doing what I'm doing for you, I, I turn around and I realize God has done what I needed done for me. These are these are proven strategies that um, will help you, I promise you, to, you know, really pull your pull your mind out of some of the most difficult seasons. And then number three, <clears throat> number three, managing your mind, intentionally concentrate on your advantages. Number one, number two, invest yourself into helping others. And then number three, and finally, begin to strategize the next phase of your life. This gives you focus. I know that you're in the middle of a, a test right now, but sometimes it's in the middle of a test that you need to think about. Cast your mind ahead of this test. Cast your mind into the positive future and begin to think about what you're going to do in the next phase of your life. And it's amazing how when you pull your mind out of, you know, the gutter of worry and the gutter of despair and you intentionally cast your mind ahead into a positive future and you begin to strategize your future, you know, ignoring like Abraham, the Bible says uh, he did not consider his own body now that he ignored the circumstances and he cast his thought into the future. He, he, he started thinking about all of the children he was going to have. When you strategize the next phase of your life, it creates a creative energy that empowers you to move out of this present dilemma. Because this gives you focus. You see, worry, as long as you allow your mind to stay in worry and despair and panic, it, 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 or it drowns your creativity. It um, demolishes your discernment. It stops your spiritual ears from hearing the revelation of the Holy Spirit on how to come out of this. But when you go into the future, come on now, and you say, God, I trust you. So I'm, I'm going to take a pause from worrying about this. I'm going to begin to strategize the next phase of my life because it got to happen. Nothing's going to stop me from getting to where you promised me I would go. It gives you the kind of focus that when you come back from visiting your future, God gives you in that in that moment of faith. God gives you everything you need to step through this present uh, challenge or testing. Now, the Bible says in Proverbs 29 and 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no, no vision, no forecast of a preferred future, no glimpse of a preferred future, no vision. You, you, you can't see beyond where you are, no vision. The people perish. When you lift up your eyes and you look from where you are and you can see where God is bringing you and you, you, are, you, are, 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 you have the audacity to actually strategize the next phase of your life, when you may be in the greatest test of your life, the power of your vision ushers God into your world. And even the things that have caused you to scratch your head, God gives you the antidote for the present challenge. So you have to, number one, intentionally, intentionally concentrate on your advantages. Number two, invest yourself into helping others. When nothing's going well for you, help somebody else. Number three, strategize the next phase of your life. The power of your vision will pull you out of any negativity and will give you clarity relative to how to come through even this present season. So my prayer is that... Um, 
that the Spirit of God is speaking to you. And those of you that are struggling with emotional heaviness, I want you to know right now that I come against it prophetically as your prophetic voice, as I am to many of you. I come against it now in the name of Jesus. And I speak peace and rest to your souls. In Jesus' name, the Spirit of God gives you victory even over what seems like an emotional breakdown. The devil is still a liar. The power of God is pulling you through this season and moment right now. In the name of Jesus, I command peace to come to your mind. I command rest to come to your soul. I command clarity, positivity to be your portion and the spirit of God rescue you now from depression, from heaviness, from suicide, from wanting to give up and throw in the towel and the spirit of God elevate you now in Jesus' name and I call it done.